Greetings to everybody. We'll get started in just a minute. People are just entering the room and we'll let people enter the room and then we will begin. And welcome to everybody. It's uh, Jeff Sachs here. We'll we'll get started shortly. Uh, the room is, is still filling with participants, and so we'll give people time to enter the room, get settled, have your coffee, uh, and uh, and then and then we'll get uh, we'll get started. Greetings to everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, on the Lancet COVID-19 Commission report. We're going to have three webinars that follow up on the report. Uh, today is on the question of the origin of the pandemic and uh, more specifically, really, the origin of the virus SARS-CoV-2 that is the pathogen uh, that uh, caused this pandemic. Uh, on uh, November 21st, at the same hour, that is 8 to 10 Eastern time, 8 to 10 a.m., we'll have a session on global health finance, which is a major theme of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. And on December 8th, we'll have a webinar on health system strengthening, which is also a major theme of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. So today the focus <laughs> is on the question of the origins of the virus. This is a, a big issue. First, of course, we're experiencing the worst pandemic uh, in modern times, and uh, the origins uh, are important to understand. But also the question of origins uh, is crucial for the understanding of how to prevent future pandemics as well. Uh, and so this is not uh, only a historical question, what just happened to us in the world, uh, a pandemic that has claimed uh, 18 million deaths worldwide <coughs> by uh, current estimates, uh, but uh, how do we prevent this from happening in the future? Let me give you just a couple of minutes of background about the Lancet Commission itself. Uh, the Lancet Journal <coughs> hosts commissions on major themes of public health, uh, and it has been doing this for uh, many, many years. And these commissions uh, have played a, a major role in helping to uh, explain to the broad public and the policy community the, the best knowledge on various facets of public health. Uh, so it was a great honor and a big responsibility for me to be asked by the editor of The Lancet, Richard Horton, to chair a commission uh, on the pandemic. Uh, and we decided to launch this commission uh, in mid-2020. I was kind of hoping the pandemic would be over uh, a year after, maybe two years after. Now we're more than two years running and we're still very much in the midst of this pandemic. But we decided that the Lancet COVID-19 Commission would not be uh, a lifetime uh, enterprise, but would uh, draw to a close at the time of the UN General Assembly 
this year in 2022 when we released the report. It's available on the Lancet website and on the uh, COVID-19 Commission website on September 14th, 2022. The idea of the Commission from the start was to give real-time advice and understanding about this uh, burgeoning pandemic, but also we hope to draw lessons more generally for the world uh, on how to finish up this pandemic and how to take steps uh, following this pandemic for future preparedness and more generally just a better and healthier and more prosperous world. Alas, the, the report is, uh, it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a happy report. Uh, it is a report mostly of failure rather than success. Uh, we don't know how many people have died so far. Uh, the official count is uh, or something like 7 million, depending on whose official numbers you're using. The estimates that uh, try to include the unreported cases and of death but that aren't counted and therefore involve uh, modeling assumptions are around 18 million that's a disaster uh, and, a, and a huge tragedy and of course the pandemic continues and we remain highly vulnerable to new variants uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 well today we're talking about how this started and uh, what we know about the origin of the virus. Also the question, when exactly did it start? The answer is we don't know. Uh, and the conclusion of the Lancet Commission is that there are two absolutely viable hypotheses. Neither has been fully investigated. Uh, the idea that there's one story which is overwhelmingly likely to be true is not right. There are two possible uh, origins of this virus. And they, the fact that there are two possible origins not only tells us a lot about what needs to be investigated to do better to ascertain what really happened, but it means that we have two kinds of risks for the future also. And uh, those absolutely both need to be faced. Now, I can just uh, uh, say that in our key findings, I'll quote, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2 remains unknown. There are two leading hypotheses that the virus emerged as a zoonotic spillover from wildlife or a farm animal, possibly through a wet market. The, the Huanan market has been pointed to in a location that is still undetermined or that the virus emerged from a research-related incident during the field collection of viruses or through a laboratory-associated escape. So this is the first point, uh, that two very distinct hypotheses are present. Uh, in our key recommendations, we say WHO governments and the scientific community should intensify the search for the origins of SARS-CoV-2, investigating both a possible zoonotic origin and a possible research-associated origin. The search for origins requires unbiased, independent, transparent, and rigorous work by international teams in virology, epidemiology, bioinformatics, and other related fields. And we say further in our recommendations we call for a dual track to prevent future emerging infectious diseases. To prevent natural spillovers, governments should coordinate on the global surveillance and regulation of domestic animals and wild animal trade and take stronger measures against dangerous practices. To prevent research-related spillovers, WHO should be given new oversight authority regarding the biosafety, biosecurity, and bio-risk management of national and international research programs that are engaged in the collection, testing, and genetic manipulation of potentially dangerous pathogens. Very interestingly, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, researchers at Boston University uh, showed, uh, made through gain-of-function 
research that is a manipulation in the laboratory, a more dangerous pathogen than the Omicron variant. Uh, they mixed and matches parts from the Omicron virus and parts from the original uh, so-called Wuhan uh, variant of SARS-CoV-2. And when this came out, uh, NIH itself, the US oversight agency that actually funds these labs in part, said, whoa, uh, you didn't even tell us about this research. Apparently, uh, it was unsupervised and unapproved. And uh, the university uh, rather sniped back saying, no, we don't have to tell you. We, we decided on this. It, it kind of illustrated uh, the situation that we are in in the world with regard to the absolutely uh, remarkable advances in uh, the technologies of genetic manipulation and the fact that not maybe not surprisingly um, the regulatory oversight lags far behind the realities of this kind of dangerous research. Well, we as a commission heard from many, many scientists, reviewed <laughs> the records and like the whole, uh, almost all the scientific community, I should say, uh, but much of it, uh, you can't really determine one way or another between the research related uh, spillover and the natural origins spillover. And therefore, it's crucial, both in the investigation and in the follow up regulatory uh, implications that both of these lines of possibility uh, be followed. It is concerning, though, that we have not had a proper public understanding of these two different possibilities from the start. I think it's right to say that um, while both have been heatedly debated, most of the uh, mainstream media has uh, gone with the uh, natural origins hypothesis and a lot of the alternative media have gone with the uh, laboratory uh, associated or the research associated uh, range, but we have not had the open public discussion and understanding of this. Uh, a senator recently, Senator Burr, uh, issued uh, his, his own report saying that um, in his conclusion and his staff's conclusion, he put a lot of weight on a laboratory release as a possibility. Uh, others have taken a different view. The purpose of today's meeting is to have a kind of airing of the issues, a, a, a broad discussion of the issues. The way we're going to do it is we're going to hear from two leading scientists that have been looking at this from the start, uh, and then one of the leading reporters that has been covering this assiduously from the very start. They're each going to present uh, from 10 to 15 minutes of their perspectives on this. Then we're going to open it up for the uh, some of the commissioners of the Lancet COVID Commission that are on this call. And then during this process, I would encourage everybody that's listening to send in questions. And you can do that by the chat function or by the Q&A function. There are a number of reporters that are on the line. I would hope that they would raise questions, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of the public online. Of course, we're recording this so that uh, I anticipate it will be very widely watched by thousands, tens of thousands of people in the coming days. Uh, and so we'll have a very, very interesting discussion of these issues. And without further ado, we're going to hear from two scientists who have been watching this very closely. Uh, and have been writing about it extensively, and I would say following every twist and turn uh, of this saga from the earliest days. Uh, the first is Alina Chan, who is a, a researcher uh, in synthetic biology, vector engineering, and medical genetics at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. 
and uh, she wrote a wonderful book uh, about the pandemic uh, that uh, has a, a great couple of chapters uh, where uh, an advocate speaks on one side, an advocate speaks on the other side, so that the reader can hear uh, a fantastic uh, uh, debate between these two possibilities. Uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Chan has continued to look in uh, incredible detail at every aspect of the evidence um, of the genome itself of SARS-CoV-2, uh, of the research uh, environment, of the um, nature of the investigations that have been carried out to date. So let's start uh, with Dr. Alina Chan. Uh, and uh, next, uh, I'll introduce the, the speakers, the next speakers after that. So uh, Alina, thank you so much for, for being a part of this webinar today, which I think is extremely important for helping people to understand what this debate is all about. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. Uh, so I have two things to say first before I get into my slides. So the first thing is that the science has been clear since day one that we just don't know, that there is not enough evidence to say that one hypothesis is plausible and the other is not plausible. So up till today, the available evidence is all circumstantial. None of it is definitive or dispositive. Uh, none of it is direct evidence of a natural or lab origin. And, and so the second thing I'll say is that uh, this, this issue has become more about politics, unfortunately, over the last almost three years now. Uh, and as the death toll has risen, I think the stakes have gotten higher and higher. And so I think that there are many scientists and virologists and journalists who are rightly afraid that if they dig too deep, we're going to find out that this pandemic started from research activities and it's going to implicate a whole coalition of scientists. So not just scientists in China, but scientists in the US who funded, collaborated with this work, scientists across Southeast Asia who, who helped collaborate and sent samples up to this lab in Wuhan. So this, this issue here is not about did one scientist make a oopsie in Wuhan and cause a pandemic. This question is like, is, is there you know, a community of dozens, possibly hundreds of scientists all conducting this type of high risk virology research who might suddenly find themselves um, blamed for this pandemic. And, and so much easier to, to point to this nameless, voiceless uh, wildlife trader in the market in Wuhan and say that this person caused a pandemic because then we, we don't have to blame anybody and we, we don't actually have to do anything. We don't have to regulate our research. Uh, there's no motivation, there's no incentive to drive uh, uh, change, to, to drive safer and more transparent research. So with that said, I'm, I'm going to dive in into uh, the slides and then hopefully they are helpful to everyone here. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming you can see my slides. So there are, everyone can see my slides? Okay. If, yes, we, we see them. Here. We see them clearly, Alina. <laughs> okay, Thank you. Uh, so, so I'll say this about the origin. There's, there's almost no dispute that the ancestral origin of this virus, the pandemic virus, came from bats at some point, that the far distant ancestor of this virus must have come from bats at some point. Uh, but the question really is, how did, those, how did that bat virus end up in humans in 2019? And, and there are two types of spillovers, natural versus lab. And they are discerned this way because the ways to prevent such uh, natural or lab uh, spillovers, uh, it, it matters how it, the virus got from bats to humans. So the natural spillover scenarios are where you have an intermediate host. So this is, a, this is the favorite hypothesis is that from bats, it jumps to an animal that's more similar to humans, adapts there, and then jumps to humans, gains the ability to jump from the animal to humans and causes an outbreak. So this uh, plausibly could have happened in Wuhan through the wildlife trade, through animals like these that were sold in Wuhan. Uh, another natural spillover scenario is where a person in their non-research related activities is exposed to bats. So this could be someone who is mining for guano in a cave or a local villager, someone who has a lot of interfacing with bats and gets that virus. And somehow it's enough to, tr to trigger an outbreak. So somehow that virus, although it came from bats, already had the ability to transmit and cause a, a human outbreak or circulate in humans for a while before jumping to, into, into a larger population in Wuhan, let's say. Uh, in the lab scenarios, th this one is actually very similar to the to, to this natural spillover scenario. But instead of a, a cave miner or a local villager, it's a scientist who's out there collecting samples from animals or people living in these communities from the wildlife trade, let's say. 
And through that, the scientist goes to a city where it ignites an outbreak. So these two scenarios are really difficult to, to differentiate. And you can only tell the difference by contact tracing, by knowing who the earliest cases were uh, and seeing who, who was the person who was exposed to these animals and, and brought it into the city. The last uh, scenario uh, in the lab category is the one that's very controversial because it involves this new uh, new arena of science where, where scientists have now uh, gained such techniques that they can seamlessly construct, synthesize, engineer, uh, recombine, splice, all these words like to, to, to recreate different viruses that might have pandemic potential. And it's possible that during research, especially if you're not doing it at the appropriate biosafety level, or you didn't know that you created a pandemic pathogen, you could have an accident and that can be carried out into the human population, let's say in a city where that lab is located. So uh, the reason why it's been so difficult over the last almost three years to tell how the virus came to humans in Wuhan is because as you can see, a virus that comes through this arm could look exactly like a virus that comes through this arm. So it looks it looks perfectly natural. It doesn't have to have any signs of lab engineering. And, and the problem is also that with today's technology, modified pathogens can have no patterns or signs of uh, genetic tinkering. So that there's no like, aha, this person signed their like John Hancock on this virus. So it, 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 no, no amount of machine learning can, can tell you whether or not this, uh, this virus was engineered unless, unless the person deliberately put signs in there that they engineered it and then told everyone that I engineered this virus. Okay, so let's look at the evidence that's available. And again, I just want to remind it's all circumstantial, not just the Lancet Commission, but even the WHO SAGO team, the Scientific Advisory Group for Origins of Novel Pathogens, uh, and the US intelligence community, and, and many scientists all say that we don't know. We need to gather more evidence before we can reach a dispositive or a strong conclusion about where this virus came from. So if you look at natural evidence, uh, natural origin evidence, there are some key pieces of evidence that uh, scientists and investigators would be looking for when tracking a, a novel pathogen. So the first thing is seeing whether the earliest cases were interfacing with live animals. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, you, you could argue that that's possible, that because the earliest cluster, the largest cluster known, was at this uh, wildlife market in Wuhan, that some of these earliest cases might have been exposed to live animals. The problem here is that by the time the market was investigated, a lot of these vendors were not vendors who were uh, sellers of wildlife. So they were like shrimp vendors uh, selling like domestic goods, frozen cold chain products, uh, and the whole market was covered. So this, this market, the size of 10 uh, NFL football stadiums, it was just plastered with virus by the time the uh, local CDC and the Beijing CDC arrived to, to sample. So in this case, we, we just don't know whether the earliest cases had been exposed to live animals. It could very easily have been a person who brought it into this very crowded and contaminated space and it spread the virus everywhere. So another piece of evidence that people look for is infected animals at, at the markets or at the farms in the supply chain. So this is again also missing for SARS-CoV-2. So some will argue that, yeah, but when the investigators arrived at the market, there were no live animals, or that's what they reported. There were no live mammals specifically that could have been the intermediate host. So, so then the question is really, did they go back to the farms, to the supply chain? And according to the investigators, they did some of that, but they still didn't find it. Um, so again, it's just emphasizing that the absence of evidence is not evidence against a natural origin. I'm just saying that just look at this, the available evidence is very weak and a lot of key evidence is missing. So uh, next, <laughs> you look for animal variants of the virus. So presumably, if a virus is very transmissible and can jump easily from species to species like SARS-1 or SARS-CoV-2, uh, you'd expect to find many animals infected that virus to, to show signs of this virus having spread in the wildlife trade. And, and these would be almost like 99 plus percent matches to the human outbreak virus. So these were easily found for SARS-1 and MERS, but till today, we have not seen any of these for SARS-CoV-2 uh, as an original source. So, so not counting the ones where a human has clearly given it to minks in Denmark or, or to deer in the US, but we cannot find any original animal variants of this virus. Uh, and another piece of evidence is uh, antibody serological evidence of uh, infected animals or traders. So uh, these were again, very quickly found for SARS-1 and MERS. Uh, but not found for SARS-CoV-2. So the question is, were, were any of these tests done 
and, and that's really open question, um, unfortunately was not addressed uh, by the WHO China investigation last year. Uh, and lastly, once you have established many of these key evidences, you want to see whether there is a strong wildlife conduit between the known bat reservoir and the outbreak site. So for SARS-1, actually, it took, it took a decade to go and find the bat reservoir. Uh, and then the scientists there said, yes, they, they knew there was a wildlife trade between that place in Yunnan, where there were farms growing civets and sending them directly to Guangdong, where a lot of civets were being consumed. But in the case of SARS-CoV-2, the opposite is true. So we already know the bat reservoir. We already know where the closest relatives are, like a 97% match. These are in Yunnan, in South China, and South, uh, Southeast Asia and Laos. So we know where these bat reservoirs are, but we don't know how an animal would have gotten from there to Wuhan. So again, it could have been through the, the small wildlife trade that went up there, or it could have been through researchers who were sampling these areas and bringing samples back up into Wuhan. So none of these key evidence have been established for SARS-2, and that is why, in my opinion, it's too early to say that we know that the market is the only plausible hypothesis. That's, that's just wrong. <laughs> there isn't enough evidence to support that. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's premature to say that's the only one that should be considered widely disseminated in the media or investigated. So let's look at the lab origin. What, what is the circumstantial evidence that exists for lab origin? So there's, in Wuhan, the headquarters of virus hunting, uh, and this was an expensive program targeting animals and humans. So not just animals like bats and animals in the wildlife trade, but even people. People who live near these uh, caves and were in the wildlife trade, they wanted to find sick people and sick animals, sample them, and take those samples up from eight countries, including China, to Wuhan. And, and this lab was very unique. So this, as far as I know, this is the only lab that, that does all these activities which I'm going to go through. And this is why this striking coincidence compels us to look into a lab origin of this work. Uh, this lab had also found and developed SARS-2, like in, an interest in studying SARS-2 like viruses by 2013. So several years even before the pandemic. Um, they had learned advanced virus isolation and seamless cloning uh, from collaborators in the US they had also developed it on their own. So they were really doing some cutting edge work in this lab. Uh, worryingly though, they, they underestimated the dangers of some of these virus. Uh, so they worked with the live virus, uh, not at the highest biosafety. They weren't doing all this in BSL-4 because it'd be very expensive and difficult to do this work at that level. But they were doing it at biosafety level two and three. So two different types of lab spaces where we know that SARS-CoV-2 is really difficult to contain. So SARS-CoV-2 definitely cannot be contained by a BSL-2, which, which cannot protect you against airborne uh, SARS-like virus. And BSL-3, we've seen instances uh, like in, in Taiwan, where unfortunately at this top BSL-3 lab, human error led to a young double vaccinated worker getting infected and exposing 100 people before they realized that the virus had leaked from the lab. Um, and lastly, there, there is this, uh, research proposal that was leaked last year, uh, in September of last year, describing this uh, cleavage site insertion program that was pitched by both the Wuhan scientists and their collaborators in the US. So they had this idea, they said, what, what happens if we start putting these rare and novel cleavage sites, these features, into a weak SARS virus in the lab? So they don't, they don't specify which cleavage sites they had seen, they don't specify what SARS-like viruses they have in their lab, but they say, well, if we take a weak one and we put a cleavage site in there so we can understand how this might cause a pathogen to have a human infection potential. So again, none of these are definitive, but they are very concerning. So I, I'm going to end here and I'm very interested in answering questions from the, the audience today and the Lancet commissioners, because there are ways to investigate both natural and uh, lab origin. And, and some of these don't even require us to go into China. A lot of the investigation can be done outside of China. So I hope that today we'll be able to reach some ideas uh, on practical steps to move forward. Thank you. Alina, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful and, and very clear. And uh, let's go into that question of how to investigate uh, these different pathways more deeply and what we could learn in the US uh, um, and what we could learn in China, what kind of information we need uh, to develop further. So uh, our next uh, speaker uh, is uh, Professor Richard Ebright. 
uh, and he is the Board of Governors Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers University, and he's the Laboratory Director at the Waxman Institute of Microbiology. He's been uh, watching this extremely closely uh, and has been involved in these questions about uh, the laboratory study <coughs> of uh, pathogens for a long time. Uh, so I know that uh, Richard has a lot to uh, say and a lot to teach us. Thank you, Richard, for, for being here. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Very good. So I'd like to concur with Dr. Sachs and Dr. Chan on the key points. I will re-summarize those same key points and then speak to steps that should be taken next. So with respect to our current status, as you've heard from both Dr. Sachs and Dr. Chan, the available scientific data, and by that I mean the sequence of the viral genome, the properties of the virus, and the epidemiology of the disease, those data do not enable a choice between or even assigning relative probabilities to natural spillover versus research-related spillover. The available other data, these include the research performed by the Wuhan Institute of Virology and its collaborator and funder, EcoHealth Alliance, in 2016 to 2019, uh, to 2018, the research that was proposed by Wuhan Institute of Virology and EcoHealth in 2018 and 2019, and the inadequate biosafety protections used by Wuhan Institute of Virology and EcoHealth Alliance in 2016 to 2019, and finally, the lack of transparency by Wuhan Institute of Virology and EcoHealth after the start of the pandemic. These features point to, but by no means prove, research-related spillover. I'd like to just briefly summarize what those available other data are. First, with respect to the research performed by the research team in 2016 to 2018, the researchers performed two categories of high-risk research. One of those was virus discovery research in wildlife, which, as you've heard, involves collecting samples intensively uh, in areas that are remote and rarely accessed, returning those samples to a laboratory and characterizing viruses or virus nucleic acid sequences in the samples, characterizing viruses uh, for their ability to infect human cells, their ability to replicate in human cells, and for their ability to infect laboratory animals. That was one category of high-risk research. A second category of high-risk research performed by the research team in 2016 to 2018 was virus gain-of-function research or enhanced potential pandemic pathogen research. This category of research involves starting with a natural virus discovered in the first program of research and then modifying that virus in ways that potentially uh, could increase ability to infect human cells, to replicate in human cells, and to infect and uh, cause pathogenesis in laboratory animals. That research included uh, constructing novel chimeras or hybrids of viruses that combine the spike gene of one bat SARS-related coronavirus with the rest of the genetic information of another bat SARS-related coronavirus. It involved constructing such chimeras that were found to have greater than 10,000-fold increases in viral growth and greater than four-fold increases in lethality uh, in mice engineered to display human receptors for SARS-like viruses uh, and other high-risk activities. So this is research that we know was performed in 2016 to 2018. We know it was performed in Wuhan because the research was published in scientific journals and because progress reports for the research, which was performed with NIH funding, have been released under FOIA lawsuit. We next turn to the research that was proposed by the research team in 2018 to 2019. We know about the proposals because a proposal for renewal of an NIH grant for the research was submitted in 2018 and awarded in 2019, and a proposal uh, 
for a second line of funding for expansion of the research was submitted to uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, in 2018. Uh, this research that was proposed by the research team included a large-scale expansion of the program of high-risk virus discovery in wildlife and an expansion of the program of high-risk virus gain-of-function research, including the construction of additional novel chimeric SARS-related coronaviruses that combine the spike gene of one with the rest of the genetic information of another. Also the construction of novel consensus SARS-related coronaviruses that use the sequence of multiple natural viruses to generate an, if you will, average sequence that represents the shared features of the group. And the insertion of protease cleavage sites, including furin cleavage sites, at the spike chain S1, S2 border, precisely the point where a furin cleavage site is present uniquely among its group of viruses in SARS-CoV-2. Then we turn to the inadequate biosafety protections that were used by the research team in 2016 to 2019. Shockingly, all of the virus discovery research and almost all of the virus gain of function research was performed at biosafety level two. This is a biosafety standard that cannot provide effective protection against a virus that has the transmission properties of SARS-CoV-2. This is a biosafety standard such that if researchers are using this and encounter a virus with those transmission properties, they likely will become infected and therefore likely will be able to leave the lab and transmit that infection to others. Uh, so all of the research short of research on experimental animals was performed at biosafety level two, in many cases with lapses even in biosafety level two set standards, such as the failure to wear sufficient protective equipment. The only research was performed at a higher standard was research with experimental animals, and that was performed at biosafety level three. Uh, none of the research at the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology on bat SARS related coronaviruses were performed at the higher level of biosafety, biosafety level four, which is generally shown in, in images of laboratories performing research of this. Uh, finally, we have the lack of transparency by uh, the research team. Uh, I would simply point out here that the simplest way to close consideration of the matter would have been to be transparent and forthcoming and to open the books. The research team has not done that. And that lack of transparency arguably has probative value. So overall, I believe the totality of the evidence, considering both the available scientific data, which are inconclusive, and the available other data, which by themselves also are inconclusive, the totality of the evidence meets and exceeds the standard of probable cause that would provide basis to initiate an investigation. An investigation must be performed. An investigation needs to be performed in order to go beyond the available data to obtain the data that have not yet been released. I would also argue that the totality of the evidence provides and exceeds the standard uh, required to improve oversight to take steps to reduce risks of recurrence. So turning to what those next steps would be, the first crucial step is to initiate a comprehensive, independent, forensic investigation of origins of COVID-19, pursuing lines of evidence both inside China and outside China. And I think that last point is crucial. Uh, the virus entered human populations in Wuhan, in Hubei province, in China, but there are lines of evidence outside China that need to be investigated that have not been investigated. The research that I summarized was funded by the United States government. It was funded by the United States Agency for International Development. It was funded by the NIH, uh, and it was funded by other US agencies. The research also was performed in collaboration with a US private organization, EcoHealth Alliance, which provided funding, cooperation, collaboration, and co-authorship on research papers. And the research in part was performed in collaboration with other laboratories in the United States. 
Therefore, there are records. There are records on hard drives. There are records in files. There are records in memories of persons who were involved in the funding and in the collaboration in the United States, which would be available for an independent forensic investigation. And that could be accessed without the cooperation, without the need for cooperation of China. Uh, it is remarkable that such an investigation has not yet occurred and that these uh, documents and records have not yet been assessed. That needs to occur. Moving beyond that, it is time to take the next steps to prevent future uh, spillovers, both natural and research related. And this can be undertaken before knowing and without knowing the full facts regarding the current pandemic and its origin. We should restrict, by that I mean reduce the amount of, and regulate, by that I mean increase the oversight of wildlife markets and wildlife farming. This, of course, is what one does to reduce the likelihood of future natural spillovers. And in addition, we should restrict, again, reduce the amount of, and regulate, again, increase the oversight of high-risk wildlife virus, virus discovery research and high-risk virus gain-of-function research. I'd like to speak just a bit further to this last point. Uh, when we discuss the subject, we refer to three different topics, biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk management. Biosafety refers to protections against the accidental release of a pathogen. Biosecurity refers to protections against the deliberate release or the theft of a pathogen. And biorisk management refers to risk benefit assessment performed before conducting or while conducting high-risk research on a pathogen. If we turn to each of those one by one with respect to biosafety, the protection against accidental release, biosafety is achieved using a set of controls. These include engineering controls, which are features of infrastructure or containment that separate a pathogen from the researcher and operational controls, which are operational procedures and personal protective equipment that again, separate a pathogen from a researcher and management controls, including planning, training and incident reporting. These controls are grouped into sets of standards. The lowest standard relevant to pathogens is biosafety level two or BSL-2. And the requirements for BSL-2 include the following and only the following, a lockable door, screen windows, an uncarpeted floor, a sink and eyewash, a decontamination or sterilization device, gown and gloves. This I point out again is the level of biosafety at which most research on bat SARS related coronaviruses both virus discovery and virus gain of function research was performed at Wuhan Institute of Virology. Second level is biosafety level three or BSL-3. This includes all of the features mandated for BSL-2 plus negative air pressure, tandem self-closing doors, sealed windows, mandatory use of a biosafety cabinet and a rear closing gown. And the highest level, for highest risk pathogens, biosafety level four or BSL-4, which includes all of the features mandated for BSL-3, plus pass-through decontamination sterilization, an exit shower, donning and doffing room and shower, positive pressure suit, uh, basically a space suit, and an independent air supply. For reference, a BSL-2 facility looks like this. You have a researcher wearing a laboratory jacket, and gloves in a standard laboratory room, optionally using a biosafety cabinet for the research. Again, this is the level of research that was performed for most of the work, all of the work short of animal studies at Wuhan Institute of Virology. At biosafety level three, one has a mandatory use of a biosafety cabinet, one has a front closing gown and face protection, and as shown here, optional use of a powered personal air respirator uh, for further protection. And at biosafety level four, one has a fully contained room, 
uh, full suits for investigators with independent uh, air supplies from the exterior. This is what we see often in photographs of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This is a level of biosafety standard that is available to Wuhan Institute of Virology, but this is not the level at which the research with SARS-related coronaviruses was performed in 2016 to 2019 in that laboratory. All of the research short of animals was performed at biosafety level two, and the research with animals was performed at biosafety level three. How does one achieve uh, biosecurity? This includes controls, engineering controls, such as security of entrance, video surveillance and video archiving, operational controls, such as a rule for two persons to be present at all times, uh, and management controls, including registration, inspection, personnel, reliability assurance, training, inventory, monitoring, and incident reporting. And how does one achieve bio-risk management, which again is the risk-benefit assessment for the highest risk research. This involves first identifying proposed high-risk research on pathogens, that is to say, proposed research activities reasonably anticipated to increase a pathogen's transmissibility, pathogenesis, pathogenesis, ability to overcome immune response or ability to overcome a vaccine or to reconstruct an eradicated pathogen, and then performing a formal risk benefit assessment, enumerating the risks, enumerating the benefits, weighing the risks against the benefits, and reaching a decision either to proceed as proposed or to proceed with additional risk mitigation or not to proceed. So with respect to biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk management, it is clear how it can be performed. Unfortunately, currently in the United States, oversight of biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk management is performed by federal agencies that perform the research or fund the research, which provides an inherent conflict of interest. Even more important, there are absolutely no regulations with force of law for biosafety or bio risk management or any pathogen other than smallpox virus. Uh, this is in contrast to, for example, the extensive regulations for research on human subjects or vertebrate animals. Because there are no regulations with force of law in these areas, there are no enforceable measures, there is no monitoring, and there is no enforcement. And there are only inadequate regulations addressing management controls but without providing specific guidance uh, or specific regulation on uh, operational controls for, uh, for biosecurity. These points need to be addressed, and we already have the information in hand to know that we should be, indeed must be, proceeding with uh, strengthening biosafety, biosecurity, and biorisk management if we wish to avoid the next pathogen. So thank you. Richard, thank you very, very much. Uh, could I ask you, by the way, but, uh, before we turn to the next speaker, is the research that was posted by Boston University gain of function research in, in your opinion? Without question. The researchers in that work constructed novel chimeric coronaviruses that combined the spike gene of Omicron BA1 with the rest of the genetic information of the original Wuhan 1 virus from 2019 or 2020. The resulting viruses acquire both the high immune escape properties of Omicron and they acquire a higher severity in experimental animals, specifically engineered to reflect infection properties in humans. Uh, so one has enhanced, one has a combination that has an enhanced combination of immune escape and severity. That is a gain of function as defined in the US policies that were affected in 2014 to 2017. That also is an enhancement of a potential pandemic pathogen as defined in the US policies that are in effect at the current time. And, and am I correct that uh, it looks from the NIH's response that they didn't know about it beforehand actually, so that there really was no oversight of that research? Well, that, that is the norm and it, since the time of the report for Boston University, at least three additional laboratories performing the identical or nearly identical research of combining the spike gene of an Omicron virus with the rest of the genetic information of a 2019 or 2020 SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, have been identified. Uh, so this is research that is happening in multiple locations and in no location as far as 
can be determined with a national level risk benefit review having been performed before the research was carried out. And in most cases with no knowledge by federal agencies that the research has been carried out. Yeah, th thank you very much. Extremely interesting and important. Uh, our third uh, panelist uh, is uh, Emily Kopp of US Right to Know. Uh, Emily is an investigative reporter and US Right to Know is an organization that has uh, committed itself to getting information that the government doesn't want us to know often. And I, I can say in my own experience as chair of the Lancet Commission, uh, there was no transparency by key participants in this process. I experienced it because I asked EcoHealth Alliance, for example, to provide the information of what it was doing. And I was told very explicitly, no, EcoHealth Alliance is advised by its lawyers not to provide the information. Uh, and that was a big problem for the work of the Lancet Commission because we are committed to complete transparency and, by the way, to finding out what, what really happened. Well, uh, it's very notable that U.S. Right to Know, <laughs> along with other groups, took on the challenge of getting information that the U.S. government did not and others did not want release because we have a Freedom of Information Act that at least gets some of the information out, even though some of it remains hidden, it redacted, in other words, disguised as it's released. But uh, Emily Kopp has been assiduous from the beginning in pursuing this issue. So I'm really eager to hear, uh, Emily, about your update of how you see what we have learned till now uh, both about the origins and about this process of investigation or lack of investigation. So over to you. Well, thank you, Professor Sachs, for inviting me today. And thank you, Drs. Chan and Ebright, for your expertise and your tenacity. So this is a complex story. There are many important leads to pursue, including the ongoing search for traces of COVID in China's wildlife trade. But the focus of my reporting and my presentation will be on virus hunting and gain of function virology underway in Wuhan. We live in an amazing era and information about research conducted across the world can be made available to me in my Washington DC apartment through freedom of information laws. The outbreak of the pandemic was preceded by a push by US scientists to establish ties with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The University of North Carolina shared cloning technology, EcoHealth Alliance collaborated on virus hunting, the University of Texas Medical Branch advice on biosafety, and the NIH underwrote all of it. We may be able to get a glimpse into the work underway before the pandemic through freedom of information laws. These laws are premised on the right of regular citizens to details about how publicly funded institutions are run. US Right to Know has submitted dozens of FOIAs and has 13 active freedom of information lawsuits. I will describe for the commission several leads, each involving American public institutions with an obligation to provide documents to the public, as well as key obstacles. And I may get a little technical, um, but happy to answer questions after. So first, NIH and EcoHealth's progress reports. So it's clear by now that EcoHealth Alliance did extensive sampling and lab work on SARS-related viruses in collaboration with a lab at the pandemic's epicenter. Indeed, they were a world leader in this work, as Alina mentioned. Remarkably, all of the details of this work have not been made public in the nearly three years since the pandemic emerged. For example, The Intercept is in litigation with NIH in pursuit of documents related to 31 grants to EcoHealth Alliance. There are 1,400 outstanding documents that have not yet been released, in addition to 300 pages released to The Intercept but redacted in whole. So in face of this stonewalling, US Right to Know is also seeking information about EcoHealth Alliance grants in creative ways, namely through a close partner, the University of California, Davis. US Right to Know is also seeking information via a board member of EcoHealth Alliance, who also holds a position at the University of Maryland. Second, USAID and virus hunting. EcoHealth Alliance was a core partner of PREDICT, a decade long virus hunting expedition funded by the United States Agency for International Development. A key deliverable of this project was a database called EDIF. Notably, this EDIF database no longer has a functional interface and it was taken down in September, 2020. 
A separate interface that may have pulled in data from Edith is currently under construction, um, Eco Health Alliance told me. Um, an email under FOIA shows that EcoHealth Alliance president, Peter Daszak, recommended withholding sequences collected in China after the pandemic broke out because doing so would put their reputation at risk. Other documents obtained under FOIA indicate some records collected with the aid of PREDICT might have required approval from host governments for release. PREDICT was perhaps the most expansive pre-pandemic virus hunting project. Its data could shed light on the origins of COVID, natural or no. Yet data collected by this publicly funded project is not easily accessible, and there are serious questions about whether the available data is complete. Okay, number three, the National Center for Biotechnology Information and Sequence Data. So NIH's archive of partial sequences is used by scientists across the globe. But some SARS-CoV-2 sequences sampled early in the pandemic were improperly killed from NIH's public facing site. And a computational biologist has identified over 100,000 other sequences deleted from the public database. And using metadata, he ranked them in order of priority as it relates to the information about COVID's origins. He estimated processing 100,000 100, of these accessions would require two to six weeks. So it's worth underlying here that the chief obstacle to better understanding the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 may not be for lack of data, but um, because of an apathy at NIH when it comes to searching its own servers and files. Um, and to illustrate this, partial sequences of a Wuhan Institute of Virology virus with a 96% identity to SARS-CoV-2 called RATG13 were uploaded to this NIH database in 2018, but were not published until a few weeks ago. And critically, a virologist credited on an associated paper has been among the most vocal proponents of the zoonosis theory. There are also you know, possibly more creative ways to query non-public information stored by NIH. Um, for example, by asking for metadata on BLAST query inputs. NCBI also collects certain information about its users, including the URL of the website the user visited immediately prior and the user's location at the time they visited the site. All right, four. The Barrick Lab and Genetic Engineering Techniques. Renowned for cutting edge work on reverse genetic systems with coronaviruses, in 2015, the Barrick Lab in North Carolina conducted an experiment in collaboration with the Wuhan Institute of Virology on a SARS-related coronavirus described as poised for human emergence. The experiment raised eyebrows among scientists concerned about gain of function research at the time, including Dr. Ebright, I believe. This paper would later prompt concerns about a lab leak among virologists and NIH leaders in the early weeks of the pandemic. We have very few clues outside of a leaked grant report as to what sort of work was planned following the lab's earlier gain of function collaboration. And US Right to Know is currently in the midst of a mediation process with UNC to obtain this information. Okay, five, diffuse and defense spending. U.S. Right to Know has FOIA'd several defense agencies. This is important not least because a rejected grant proposal, grant proposal to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency involving EcoHealth Alliance, the Barrick Lab, and the Wuhan Institute of Virology demonstrated a desire to experiment with furin cleavage sites in SARS-related coronaviruses. And that's just the sort of work that could have conceivably resulted in SARS-CoV-2. According to a formal whistleblower complaint, the file describing the proposed work was moved by someone at DARPA into an obscure folder in a way that appeared designed to conceal it. It's important to fully understand the Pentagon's interest in virus hunting through the preempt program, which is very similar to PREDICT. If non-proliferation of unnecessarily risky research is a goal, it's critical for the US government to engender trust both among American citizens and our allies abroad through transparency. Finally, NIH and credibility. I think this is probably the most controversial and uncomfortable line of inquiry, but I think for me as a reporter, it's unfortunately critical. It involves the question, how do we decide who was credible? Two writings about the origins of COVID gained traction in the pandemic's early days. An editorial in The Lancet and a correspondence in Nature Medicine, both consigned the possibility of a lab origin of COVID-19 to the realm of conspiracy theory. But as it turns out, the, auth the authors were often conflicted in undisclosed ways or harbored private concerns about viral engineering or the store of coronaviruses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. 
but it's taken months or years for this information to be disclosed and only through FOIA requests. Um, for example, in just the last week, we learned the scientists who contributed the central ideas to the proximal origin of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 were not actually credited on the correspondence. The virologist who pitched its central premises, who pitched its central premise, was likely Ron Fouchier, a controversial figure at the center of a years-long debate about an experiment that made a 50% lethal virus airborne. I think the public would have viewed the conclusions of that correspondence very differently had that information been known when it published in March 2020, which may be why he wasn't credited. Um, so I think understanding whether trusted public messengers on the origins of COVID-19 have integrity as well as expertise is an important piece of the puzzle. Finally, I thought it might be helpful to explain what I hope to achieve by seeking this information and translating the findings for a general audience. My understanding as my job as a reporter holds that my responsibility to the public outmatches my responsibility to protect the reputation of any particular science, scientist, scientific discipline, or government agency. Even if following these leads confirms there was nothing to hide, I think they're worth pursuing. The public deserves more clarity about the pandemic's early days. And that's it. Thank you. Emily, thank you very, very much. Could I ask you to elaborate on one, one point, uh, which I, I found to be amazing? At the beginning of uh, the epidemic, I, I read, like many other people, the proximal origins of SARS-CoV-2 paper in March uh, 2020, which said that it's overwhelmingly likely to be natural, and it shifted our attention away from this second possibility. But then you have tracked almost to the hour, uh, the discussion about the origin of the origin, uh, proximal origin paper. And uh, it's really stunning, the things you found. And I just would like you to elaborate a little bit about that to explain that, because for me, this was really eye opening and exactly uh, revealed by by your work. Sure, yeah, I think this is a really critical piece of the puzzle. Um, it's really hard to oversee the impact that this correspondence in Nature Medicine had. Um, it's been cited by something like 2000 news organizations and is one of Nature Medicine's most widely read um, articles on, on COVID generally. Um, and it took 15 months in a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to reveal the circumstances um, that led to the drafting of that correspondence. Um, and what raises the eyebrows of me, um, and that I think some you know, other reporters should pay attention to, is the participation of um, NIH leaders, Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci on that call, um, as well as the fact that you know, it's been revealed very recently that it's possible that its sort of central premise was not um, formulated by the virologist who ended up credited um, in the byline. And in fact, the virologists credited in the byline were, were very concerned about um, the possibility that COVID was the result of a research-related incident um, or could be engineered. Um, and it, it seems like people who have sort of been <laughs> at the center of, you know, um, the you know, monumental debates about gain of function research were really critical to, to that correspondence, but were not credited. And so, um, and you know, one final thing I'll say is the virologists on that correspondence have continued to be very public, important public messengers on the origins of COVID um, and have been quite aggressive <laughs> in their support of, um, the natural origins theory and marginalizing other theories. And um, they have considerable expertise, but I think, you know, me and other reporters should ask the question whether they've shown integrity. So, Emily, thank you very, very much. Thank you for the very hard work because, again, uh, nothing was offered voluntarily <clears throat> everything had to be pried out and this is very strange i have to say uh, in in my capacity as chair of the commission i would have thought that in the midst of a pandemic like this the nih would have opened up everything immediately let's figure out what's happening 
in a true spirit of investigation. You've spent years now trying to pry out basic information. And that, to my mind, you know, not speaking to the question of the origins, but just the behavior of the US government is, uh, is extremely concerning to me that we haven't had transparency. I don't know if I'm allowed to share my screen, but I'm going to try because I wanted to show you, uh, I wanted to show everybody. Can you see that page uh, possibly? <clears throat> this is, uh, I, Emily, I don't know if this was the US right to know or the intercept, but it was one of the reports that was uh, through the Freedom of Information Act called for, and it's an NI. AID, that's uh, Dr. Fauci's unit, the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Disease unit at NIH. It's called Strategy for Strategic Plan for COVID-19 Research, April 10, 2020. So they gave the cover, but this is what redaction means. I don't know if people can see this, but this goes on for 300 pages. This is the report of NIH in a Freedom of Information Act supposedly informing the public of what's going on. Blank pages, blank pages, blank pages, blank pages, 290 blank pages. To my mind, unbelievable. Uh, unbelievable in uh, these circumstances uh, and with the stakes involved. Uh, let me say, uh, before we turn to uh, some of the commissioners who may have questions, uh, I, I see them on, and if they have questions, we're going to bring them in next. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Redfield uh, wanted to join, but at a last moment, he had a plane uh, flight that um, exactly at this time, so he couldn't join. He was head of the Centers for Disease Control, you'll remember, in 2020. He tends to believe that it is the research-related hypothesis that's the more likely. Uh, I don't want to speak for him uh, because you can find his interviews online. But what he did say very clearly to me and to others uh, as part of my work and as part of uh, his report to the public that when he called for an investigation of the laboratory related hypothesis inside the US government, it was he was basically uh, shut down by NIH, uh, even though he was CDC director with extensive experience in uh, these issues. And he had a lot of reason and a lot of concern both from classified information that he had access to and unclassified information and some formerly classified information that's now unclassified <coughs> that the virus uh, may well have started earlier than December, uh, that uh, there were uh, risk signs that uh, the laboratory may have been implicated, that US scientists may have been implicated very much uh, through the proposals uh, that we've talked about, but that no such investigation took place inside the US government. So just to, I think it's right to say on behalf of all of the panelists, neither hypothesis is dispositive right now. Nothing is proved, but both are absolutely viable. And what uh, Dr. Ebright said is that both require further investigation and very importantly what we've heard is that a lot of information is available in the united states because the projects that could have given rise to this virus were heavily u.s funded uh, with a lot of u.s scientists engaged a lot of record inside the u.s but uh, now so many lawsuits remaining of trying to pry information out of uh, the US. So this is uh, um, why things are so concerning, but why the call in the Lancet Commission for more independent 
transparent, science-based investigations is relevant and why we don't have to wait for one country or another. We have information right at hand <coughs> in the United States, for example, that could shed a lot of light on these issues. So uh, let us uh, open it up for uh, others. Uh, I see some of the commissioners, if they would like to speak, uh, they should raise their hands. I would ask uh, Dr. Chan and Dr. Ebright if they would like to come back on any of these topics to do so at any moment. And I know that people have also been sending in questions and uh, I'm supposed to get a list of questions. Uh, maybe it's already been sent to me uh, by the chat. Uh, so that I can also pose some of the questions. But first, let me turn to Ismail Sarah Geldin, who is one of the world's great leaders on the science policy interface in multiple capacities, uh, in leadership at the World Bank, uh, in uh, the founder of the, the modern library of Alexandria, a modern wonder of the world uh, that uh, is uh, um, based on the ancient wonder of the world, and a, a very uh, esteemed commissioner of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. So Ismail, let me uh, turn, turn the microphone over to you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for following up on this uh, particular controversial issue that we've been having earlier on. But I would like to pose a slightly different uh, approach to this. Uh, let's for a moment even assume that uh, uh, there was uh, no sufficient evidence for the lab leak theory. But the question remains that we know this research not only can be done, is being done. And therefore, a primary, it seems to me anyway, that a primary consideration for recommendations to avoid future pandemics has got to be to completely rejig the, the uh, bio-risk surveillance, the entire systems of regulations under which circumstances this particular type of research could be done. Because we know that it can be done. I mean, even if you were to prove today that it was not the cause of the original uh, 2019 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, at the very least, we know that it can be done, it is being done, but we also know that it's the supervision is totally inadequate. The regulations aren't there. And the, 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 the horror story that we heard from you and from Emily about the difficulty of, of even finding out what is going on, even in a country like the United States with the Freedom of Information Act. So it seems to me that this is an absolutely central piece for recommendations going forward, regardless of back to the past. I mean, you, you, you have to recognize it's being done and it's dangerous and that we don't have adequate uh, uh, supervision and regulations on it. So that Is, would be- uh, Ismail, thank you for the strong point. I wonder if uh, Richard uh, Ebright could comment on that because Richard's been really uh, saying for a decade, this is extremely dangerous and it has to get under control. Richard, you've been at this for a long time. What? What what uh, um, are your reactions first to what uh, Dr. Sarah Gelding has said, and and where are we on this question of uh, oversight? Because clearly we're not quite there yet. I agree completely with what Dr. Sarah Gelding said. We know enough already to know that either natural spillover or research-related spillover could have been the origin of the present pandemic. We need to investigate that. But while investigation is occurring, even before an answer becomes available, and even if no answer becomes available, and even if an answer becomes available and that answer is natural spillover, we must be taking steps to reduce the risk of the next pandemic. This is self-evident. After every plane crash, after every train derailment, there is an investigation and crucially measures are taken to reduce the risk of recurrence. That has not happened in this case. There has been no investigation and there has been no movement towards the implementation of effective oversight. That needs to change.
Yeah, I agree with both Dr. Sarah Gelden and Dr. Ebright. So there, there are two situations recently that, that really speak to this point. The first is that the NIAID awarded another multi-million dollar grant to the EcoHealth Alliance to do more of the same research, but in different countries, just not China. So again, no investigation done, but more money just poured into this organization that whose collaborators or, and funding and research activities might have started the pandemic. And the second incident is the Boston unit was the uh, revelation that they were doing uh, splicing of pandemic uh, viruses in their lab. And so where where is the oversight? <laughs> where is the transparency? Uh, the BU researchers said they did not have to report to their funders because uh, the funding that they took from NIH was just used on tools and resources and not on the high risk part of the research. So from these two incidences, it's very clear that there's very little insight into what research is being done around the world in all these biosafety labs uh, and, and whether any of it ever gets reported so that the public only finds out from either a paper being published in a high profile journal or an outbreak in their city. Thank you. I see that uh, another esteemed commissioner, Dr. Uh, professor Phoebe Condori, who is a professor uh, at uh, the Athens School of Economics and Business and a leader in sustainable development uh, worldwide uh, and uh, enormously valued commissioner um, uh, is here, uh, wants to join in. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, very clear and very informative presentations. Thank you very much. I have two questions. The first one, if we have a thorough, transparent, serious investigation, are we confident that we can have a definite answer with regards to the origins? And the second question, there are countries like the countries uh, within the European Union, where we have quite extensive biosafety regulatory framework. Did anybody investigate whether we have, uh, let's say, true transparency with regards to the research on these issues that is carried on in the EU? And is there any correlation, at least not causality, between low accidents or safety um, issues in Europe compared to the US, for example, or outside Europe? Did anybody investigate these issues? Very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Richard uh, and uh, Alina, um, if you could uh, come in, Alina, th thanks. So I think these questions are largely unanswered, and, and that's why I'm really happy to be part of this Pathogens Project, which is being organized by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And they're convening experts from all around the world to come in and meet and organize a conference in April of next year in Geneva to, to answer exactly these questions and to see what, what information should we be gathering to figure out if there are good oversight systems in different countries uh, and other ways that uh, countries can be incentivized to be more transparent with this type of work. So certainly th there's no answer right now as to whether an investigation can, can lead to a definitive answer. But we know for sure that there's a lot of evidence around the world that can can tell us, can point us closer to the origin. And so if, if we just give up now, I think that that is a big mistake. And it shows that there's no way to be uh, to hold people accountable. And, and this can lead to much more uh, dangerous research being done because people can see, oh, even if there's accidents, we'll just blame the market down the road. <laughs> but we don't have to. Uh, no one will investigate us because they're, they're too afraid to, to, to point the fingers at us. Uh, and, and this means Unfortunately, that small things like a, a single lab accident can lead to millions of people dying. And, and this is something that we cannot tolerate in the future. Emily, there's a question for you about what reasons uh, the NIH gives for the redactions that it makes, for example, the document that I showed. But <laughs> I think it's a, a more general question, in fact, which is uh, almost all of the documents that you receive by FOIA are redacted. Sometimes afterwards, the redactions are removed so we can see what was redacted. What's your feeling about how this process works? Yeah, so um, 
NIH gives a variety of excuses <laughs> as it stonewalls um, information to uh, access to public information. Um, one is that NIH has, I think, rightly received a lot of FOIA requests from people interested in COVID's origins and other aspects of the pandemic response. And so I think a common response is that they are, they are overwhelmed, but it's important to note that um, it's easy to just release documents that the challenging part is redacting because you don't want certain information disclosed. And so as a result, we're sort of on this um, delayed timeline when it comes to obtaining information. We're obtaining information about critical things that happened in February 2020 in um, October 2022. And so, which is really unacceptable. I want to ask, it's another question that has come in, uh, and I'd like your view, Emily, first, and, and then uh, Alina and Richard. Um, I think it's right to say that in that this narrative uh, that started with the proximal origins, that there's only one uh, one approach that is valid and the other not, really, I think it's right to say, did pretty much take hold in, in the major news outlets in the United States for a while. It may be changing right now. But one person asked, why are people afraid to press too hard on the scientists, or why would the reporting be in one way or another? Uh, up until recently, there was one dominant story and one kind of conspiracy theory. Now, I think it's fairer to say that, um, you know, senators, others are saying, look, it's something serious. Uh, what caused the move in one direction in the mainstream media, whereas you had to fight tooth and nail every step to, to get key information? Uh, out, even when it came, it was often not widely reported actually in uh, in mainstream uh, outlets. So just love your reflection on that. Sure. Um, I mean, to give an honest answer, I think a lot of reporters are really intimidated by this story because very few people have the sort of expertise required to evaluate the sort of scientific evidence on, on both sides. Um, and we live in an era where, um, you know, anti-science attitudes have taken hold. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's easy to be intimidated um, by this story and to sort of begin to question sort of eminent giants in the field of virology who have told us um, via the pro proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2 correspondence that um, it's impossible that this was a research related incident. Um, but again, it comes down to integrity and I don't think it takes a PhD in virology to understand that, um, you know, changing your view to believing a lab accident was possible to saying it was impossible in a conspiracy theory within about four days um, while in communication with, you know, leaders of the National Institutes of Health, which is by far the leading funder of infectious diseases research um, in the United States, uh, doesn't take a PhD in virology to, to um, conclude that something is off. <laughs> um, but, but I think another aspect here that is, again, probably controversial and uncomfortable to talk about is that um, a lot of reporters really respect Anthony Fauci. Um, and he is a brilliant scientist, but um, I think the question is whether um, brilliant scientists are capable of um, sometimes misleading the public because of a um, perhaps a fear of the truth or um, desire for a tidy narrative. I'm not sure, but um, those or are some re reasons of state or other uh, other things. Right. Yeah. I very well put. Uh, Ismail, please uh, come in. Thank you, Jeff. I have a slightly different point. And this is, uh, I recall in 2015, uh, uh, the beginning, <laughs> the genome editing, uh, CRISPR, Cas9, all this stuff going on, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine uh, created a commission 
uh, around the issue of uh, when and under what circumstances would we allow the application of these uh, techniques to humans. I had the privilege of serving on that commission for 18 months. We had hearings in the US and hearings in Europe, and we produced a report in 2017 in which we said it should not be used on embryo research at all, at least not for the time being. Probably in 2018, Professor He Jin Kang in China showed two little baby girls that had been edited, the first human edited uh, uh, and he thought, I suppose, there was going to be applause. There wasn't. The net result was the government of China put him in jail for three years. But my key point here is, can we not anticipate and say something like the National Academies of Science, National Academies of Health, along with the Royal Society, along with other people, should create commission on this question of supervising uh, uh, virology research, which is obviously inadequate. I mean, uh, uh, and what we were doing at the time was not to come back and say it has happened or it has not happened. At the time we did this in this commission, it had not happened. I mean, it was broken by other people later on, but, but the, between you and Emily and all the other eminent people we've been hearing, we have overwhelming evidence of the enormous danger that this poses. And that therefore the scientific community, now it's not a matter of holding somebody accountable or sorry. What would you recommend as a scientific community, as a medical community should be the guarantors of biosafety, bio risk analysis, and so on. And how can we get something like that maybe legislated uh, while somebody can still pursue who said what, when, about whether it was right? Great, thank you. Thank you, Ismail. And I'm gonna add one more thing and then we'll have a final round from uh, our panelists uh, and uh, then I'll, I'll make a short wrap up. Uh, but I'd like to add one more difficult and uncomfortable aspect to this, uh, if anyone would care to comment on it, and that is what is the intersection of this research with biodefense or biowarfare? And what are we, re are we seeing this intersection? And if so, my God, what, do, what does that mean for even the capacity to get at what's happening? Um, because this is a part of uh, uh, the sphere of secrecy that is probably quite intense. And I know that all of you have some uh, brushes with that in, in uh, what this could mean. So I'd like to add that to the table. Uh, how can we basically, how can we get this under control? And is the <laughs> biowarfare, biodefense side of this story, the <laughs> the known or the hidden elephant in the room, which makes this all ex even more complicated than it is. And maybe uh, we could ask uh, Alina, uh, Richard, uh, and Emily to comment uh, on that or anything else in closing, um, and, uh, um, and, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, that, that's really difficult to follow, <laughs> this idea of bioweapons <laughs> and, and secrecy. I mean, just just to get back to this question of how did this pandemic start? My, my belief is that even if it did come from a lab, it, it wasn't a bioweapon. So it, there's this long track record and all this available information showing that this lab in Wuhan and its collaborators were all really interested in understanding how pathogens function. And to me, that is, that is a very big problem, is that you have hundreds of, of labs around the world very interested in understanding how pathogens work. And they all believe that they are the most responsible and the most careful scientists out there. So they, they all have this belief that I'm not going to be the one who starts the next outbreak or the next pandemic. And unfortunately, that, that is a danger, that all of this work is, is just by default done privately. Uh, there's the scientists are not ethicists. <laughs> Most of us don't consider the question of like who should be brought into the table to discuss uh, when I plan my experiments that could affect millions of people. And, and so this this era post COVID is, is really about rethinking like how can we bring in more people than just the scientists. So scientists are not just there by themselves thinking my experiments are safe. So um, I I really wish that uh, this panel uh, had been able to to get. Uh, natural origin proponents, so people who believe that this data in the uh, market for sure, I wish that those, those people would have come because what we really need 
it's a forum where, where scientists can openly discuss and debate and, and talk about the science and talk about the, the responsibilities of the scientific community to address this issue. Thank you very much, uh, Alina. And as you know, uh, but and be sure, uh, I invited 10 of the proponents of the national uh, natural origins uh, to participate. Uh, most of them never answered at all, uh, sometimes with repeated email invitations. Uh, we didn't get any, but it was not for lack of trying. I want open, transparent discussion, uh, debate, investigation, uh, balance. This is not uh, an attempt in any way to pack a story one way or another. Quite the contrary. We're trying to uh, elicit as much understanding. And I thank all of the panelists for showing all sides of this. But I did invite many, many of the scientists that are associated with the natural origins hypothesis, but none of them uh, ag agreed to participate, which I think is, is unfortunate. Uh, let me ask Richard to come in now for closing thoughts. So on your question about biodefense and bioweapons, it's important to clarify the definitions of those terms. So biodefense as a term of art refers to preparedness for and countermeasures against bioweapons threats. A bioweapons agent is a pathogen or a biological toxin that could be used as a bioweapon. And a bioweapon is a bioweapon agent that is developed and produced for use as a bioweapon. So there are three separate terms, and it's important not to separate, not to conflate them. With respect to biodefense, all of the research that we have been talking about was performed explicitly as biodefense research and was funded from budgets appropriated explicitly for biodefense. So the research funds from NIH to EcoHealth Alliance to Wuhan Institute of Virology came from the biodefense budget specifically labeled as such and flagged as such of the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The research at Boston University, the same. The research at other US institutions that have made similar chimeras, similar to those at Boston University, the same. All of this is biodefense research, part of the effort of preparedness for and countermeasures against bioweapons threats. With respect to bioweapons agents, these are the pathogens or biological toxins that can be used as bioweapons. This research identifies new bioweapons agents. That indeed is a principal purpose, not the sole purpose, but a major purpose and why the research is funded as biodefense in the United States. Each time virus discovery in wildlife identifies a new virus that has the ability to infect humans, to replicate in humans, to infect and cause pathogenesis to experimental animals engineered to reflect infection properties in humans. Each time that happens, that is the identification of a new bioweapons agent, a new bioweapons agent uh, for which preparedness potentially can begin. Each time a gain of function research creates a new enhanced pathogen with enhanced transmissibility or enhanced pathogenesis or enhanced ability to overcome immune and response, that is the creation of a new bioweapons agent that biodefense can begin against. So this research by definition identifies new bioweapons agents. And this poses not only the material risk that we've been talking about so far, which is the risk of an accidental or deliberate release of the agent by a laboratory, but it also creates information risks. Each time a new bioweapons agent is identified and published, that publication provides, if you will, a step-by-step -step recipe to construct a new bioweapons agent a recipe that with current technology can be followed by almost any country in the world from largest to smallest, all but the very smallest, and by sub-state organizations, and even by some individuals. So this research is biodefense. It was funded explicitly as biodefense. It is listed as biodefense research on NIAID websites and 
denied appropriations. It identifies bioweapons agents, and those bioweapons agents inherently pose both materials risk of accidental release or deliberate release and information risks of copycats uh, by other nations, by sub-state organizations, or by individuals seeking to do harm. That is why this is crucial to bring under control, to restrict, and to regulate. Extremely clear and very sobering. Thank you very much. And Emily, uh, let me turn it to you for uh, uh, final thoughts for our uh, session. It's hard to improve upon those comments, um, but I'll just say, you know, we're digging into the interest of defense agencies in virus hunting and gain of function research. Um, but it seems clear to me as a layperson that there is a perception problem, um, to paraphrase a member of the NSABB, which is the independent body that advises NIH, um, doing research to prepare to defend against um, biological threats can sometimes resemble, you know, creating biological threats. Um, and so I think there's a conversation to be had and some reflection to do about, you know, whether we're doing duplicative risky research that creates a perception among other nations that um, you know we we are a danger in some way um, and whether that that perception stokes the you know uh, proliferation of labs around the world um, and unnecessary risky research so um, and then you know just as far as closing um, <laughs> I will say that I don't typically sort of outline my you know method of investigation and tell the world exactly you know which leads I'm pursuing it kind of goes against every instinct I have as a reporter um but I will just say if there are reporters on the line um you know I welcome competition we definitely need help this is such a complex story um and so so I hope reporters on the line will consider that Great. Thank you very, very much. Let me uh, thank uh, all three of our panelists uh, and our commissioners that participated for really a superb session. Uh, we will post this session on the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network website. We will uh, make sure that uh, people are aware of it. I think it's got a tremendous public educational value. I would hope that it would inspire scientists on all sides of this debate to open up for public discussion more because we really need that public discussion much more. I, I hope that our report and the very hard work of US Right to Know and the scientific probing of Dr. Chan and Dr. Ebright and many, many others uh, will finally lead to a proper, transparent, independent, science-based investigation, drawing on information from all sources, including from NIH and from the funders of a lot of the research that has been underway and places where we could find more information. The essence of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission report is that both the natural and the research associated spillover hypotheses are viable. Both urgently need further investigation and both suggest future dangers that irrespective of the past need to be addressed now. And that point I think has come through very, very clearly. We need regulation of this extremely dangerous laboratory work. We also need regulation of the safety of this research going out to collect viruses uh, in nature, uh, and uh, also regulation of these uh, uh, wildlife markets and handling of wild animals and so forth and farm animals so that we prevent future uh, spillovers that can be of such danger to humanity. Let me thank everybody for participating for questions uh, that have not been addressed yet. Uh, we will try to address them and post them on our website along with 
the uh, the posting of the uh, tape of this session. Thank you all. Remember that we have two forthcoming uh, workshops, uh, and uh, the first is on November 21, where we're going to talk about global health finance, the fact that in low-income settings, the difficulty of even having a health system that covers the population is an acute challenge that is a threat, of course, to those societies, but to the whole world in a, in a world of uh, cross-border pathogens. And uh, on December 8, uh, a special session on health system strengthening, because at the core of our report, we emphasize that health systems were not up to the task of properly controlling this pandemic, and we need to do better. Both of those sessions will be from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern time, and I look forward to everybody joining then. Thank you to all. Thank you to all the panelists, to the commissioners, to the participants, and to the team of the Secretariat of the Lancet COVID Commission, and to the SDSN and Columbia Center for Sustainable Development for enabling our webinar today. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much.